Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin Bradley, and welcome to our Facebook uh, live event. Actually, this event is recorded, which we've been doing for the last few events. But I'd want to welcome you to join us so that we can um, be in the wings for you whenever you have any questions. So, New Year. Happy New Year to everybody and um, New Decade. And we're going to talk tonight about New Year intentions and new ideas that people may have about how their therapy is working for them and um, how they can be more comfortable with their therapy so that they get the best results. So I'm really privileged tonight as well to have Justine Amder, who's um, usually here with me. Welcome, Justine. Thank you for always being by my side and offering your um, guidance and expertise in the uh, world of uh, sleep apnea. And also very honored to have our good friend, Teresa Schumard, who's, I always call the glue that keeps us all together. And she's our <laughs> voice of reason. So welcome, Sh <laughs> Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. And I'm happy that you guys joined me. So, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about 2019. Um, we're into a new year, like I said, in a new decade. But we did have quite an exciting year last year with many Facebook Live events. Uh, we had great panelists on, and I want to thank you all for coming forward, being so open and honest about um, how your therapy is working for you and how you can reach out and help each other. So it's always a great benefit when we hear from um, users themselves. I, I'm trying not, I'm getting away from patients, even though I'm a nurse myself, but I'm trying to call people PAP users. So it could be our new word, our new buzzword. But I wanted to discuss, first of all, one of the highlights that I felt that unfortunately I wasn't able to make this year was the summit in San Francisco in September. Now, if you didn't happen to be there like myself, you can also check um, out the webinars in our ASAA webpage on YouTube, uh, something I did. And um, Justin, I'm going to open it up to you first to um, just let us know about some of your highlights of that event and your takeaway messages and what you, what you learned maybe from that. I would definitely agree that that was one of our signature events for 2019 that coincided in uh, the month of September, which is our Sleep Timber annual awareness and uh, education and fundraising campaign that we have um, every September of every year. And uh, during the event at the Presidio, um, I think some of the highlights were the discussion with the a multidisciplinary approach to care, where we had the um, physician panel of um, <clears throat> mental health, uh, pulmonology, ENT, orthodontics, uh, myofunctional uh, therapy, uh, allergist. I'm probably leaving someone um, out of that, but that was a great patient panel for everybody to hear that often um, uh, uh, OSA uh, patients go into a provider during di in different doors. You know, you may go through a pulmonologist, you may go through an ENT, you may go through a, a, a dental provider. And, um, but we're all dealing with the same thing. And so, and all of those disciplines can um, help, you know, uh, increase how you're feeling and the, uh, and the care that you receive. Teresa, you have anything to, to add about that multidisciplinary panel? Well, it's just it's just so lucky to have, you know, the access to those experts because it isn't just one or the other. I mean, when I first started in sleep medicine, it came from psychiatry. That's that was that's where it came from, and it was the study of REM sleep, and you know, and then when uh, when sleep apnea was described and CPAP was. Uh, introduced, uh, it changed everything and it became the gold standard of treating OSA. But we are so lucky now because some people just cannot tolerate it no matter what they do. And so we're so lucky now to have all these other disciplines uh, to be able to chime in on, you know, helping people. It's, it's great. 
Yeah, and I feel like what you echo what you say, Teresa, because, you know, there's a lot of people that we've had on last year that have been really open and honest about their condition. And some people did have depression and did go to a psychiatrist. And maybe that psychiatrist was, you know, forward thinking enough to say, well, you're not sleeping and we should really do a sleep study. So it becomes the whole essence of, you know, what is really going on with you? And, you know, I think it resonates for our practitioners to have that holistic view of a client or patient when they present in their office to figure out like, you know, what is happening with you? You're not sleeping. Mm -hmm. Well, I read a study in the UK recently that about 65% of all um, GP, general practitioner visits, people say they're tired. So they're hearing it over and over again, but we want to get to the point where people take it seriously. And I think with the summits that we have, and people sharing their stories, it makes people think about, you know, being advocates for themselves. And that's what we're really here to help people do. With the coming year, um, you know, new decade, new year, and people have different intentions there. Um, I think uh, nowadays the idea of all of these uh, New Year's resolutions is kind of, you know, gone to the wayside and you're just interested in doing a few things differently. And, um, you know, diet and exercise are always two popular intentions that people have with the new year. And um, we were talking about this before, you know, sleep, sleep is that third pillar. Uh, Sleep is that third line of that triangle with diet and exercise. So anything that you are, um, you know, intending to do for the new year, um, sleep can can benefit you. So, you know, talk to your doctor about it. Um, Try to uh, figure out what the underlying issue for that is because, um, you know, as as you said, uh, I think in the UK that 65, you know, you said 65% of people are asking their general practitioner about it. And, you know, I think, you know, we we talked about this a little bit earlier with um, yourself, Justine and Teresa. And, you know, some of the research I do um, and looking at things and papers out there, there's a few things that are attributed now to sleep apnea and a lot of comorbidity diseases. There was a doctor I saw and I, his name, you know, I, I forget at the moment, but I, I will, it's my plan this year to reach out to somebody like that because we want advocates as well and supporters of this. But his thing was basically the more comorbidities that are addressed to sleep apnea, um, the medical community will take it a little bit more seriously. And of course, you know, being a scientific field, everybody always goes on research-based, you know, criteria and tell me this, tell me that. But I think, you know, we're seeing a shift a little bit and, and that's what we want. We want people to take it seriously. And we want you to take it seriously as as well, um, because it just doesn't help you wake up a little bit more rested in the morning. It may mean by you using your mask every night of the week consistently that you will, you know, forfeit some of these core morbidities. And Teresa, you're a great, you know, advocate for something like that too. Do you have anything to add to that out in the community? And what have you seen as a shift recently? Well, I've seen I've seen the shift into more uh, of a mindfulness, uh, if you will, to to address sleep. I mean, I have to admit, I mean, I have been around a while. And when I first started, sleep medicine was considered, oh, you know, some weird scientist in the bowels of a sleep lab somewhere in the basement, you know, and it, that's the way it was thought of. And thank goodness that, you know, we changed our attitude and uh, the federal government decided, hey, you know, we're going to do something about this as well. But it, it was funny that the sleep thought leaders at the time, and we're talking 30 years ago, had to say, wait a minute, healthy people, uh, 20 2000 was the goal and it, they have it every 10 years and it's a it's a federal uh, government initiative well sleep was missing so here they had to listen to sleep physicians and sleep researchers 
Well, they, they, you know, they had, there was a stigma related to that back then. Like, oh, you watch people sleep, ah, you know, but they started taking it seriously when we, we decided that sleep wasn't even on the menu in healthy people 2000, you know? And so it was, it was, uh, it was then included, and that was actually a, a champion move by some of uh, the thought leaders in the industry to make it so that, yeah, sleep is very important. Sleep is on the agenda, and I'm very pleased that people now have that attitude that it is as important as diet and exercise and all these other things. So, yeah. You know, and I agree. I mean, I think it's something that, you know, even in the past, even maybe we all have taken it for granted because we go to bed at night and maybe we set our alarm clock for the next day and we wake up and whether we've had eight hours or six hours or whatever, we just think, well, I'll get some sleep and then go to work or do my whatever. Mm -hmm. But we all know, and I'm sure we've all experienced the fact that if you do not get a good restful sleep at night, it does inhibit you from some of the things that you want to do. And we've actually seen instances like last year, we had people on our patient panel and someone had a car accident related to this. Or, mm -hmm. you know, a police officer is like, I need to change my job or, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I even attribute it to my fatigue being just working a crazy schedule and doing nights and todays and stuff but then it's it's this time now i think where we're encouraging people to take stock of their sleep habits and how they can improve them and how they can um maximize the benefits of good restful sleep and justine that's something you raised earlier on as well to take stock of your sleep I don't think we're calling it sleep hygiene anymore, but just, you know, the whole environment of creating a, a restful night's sleep. Is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, just as, as Teresa used the word being mindful and having the intention to, to make sleep a priority. I mean, all of our lives are busy and, you know, things come up, but then you have to kind of get refocused again and get back on track. And if you have, you know, uh, been diagnosed with uh, sleep apnea, uh, you need to make every uh, mindful uh, effort possible to follow the treatment. And if you're having struggles and issues, you know, we are here, our Facebook group is here, you know, reach out to your doctor. There, there are other online groups. You know, we had uh, Janice who is at the, um, on the uh, Presidio uh, patient panel. Um, that was, you know, she said, remember she said they gave her, the online group gave her a swift kick in the pants um, and when she needed it. And she felt so much better. So, um, you know, there, there, there is help out there for someone that's been diagnosed and, and, yeah. and needs, uh, some guidance. And, you know, there are, I mean, here we are. I, uh, Teresa will have to correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken, but it was in the eighties when the CPAP machine was, was, um, uh, formulated and, and, and started to be <laughs> used as the gold standard in care. And they've come a long way. We've mm -hmm. talked about that a lot. But, you know, we're getting into a period now where there's other things that are, that are coming out. There's a couple of different implants that are out there. There's home sleep studies now. So things, things are definitely, you know, evolving and changing is it as fast as everybody wants, maybe not. But, you know, you need to talk with your doctor, do some, you know, online research, check out our website, whatever it is to, to you know, be able to have those conversations with, with your providers and, you know, see if there is something uh, out there for you. You know, and Justin, you lead me on to a great point of um, when you say there are people out there to help. And I think one of the things that we should celebrate, and I'm going to ask Teresa's um, advice on this, or not advice, but um, she can give numbers and stuff. But I really feel that our Awake Facebook page has quite exploded in the last year. And I'm always seeing new members yeah. every week. So, Teresa, you know, I, I go on there quite regularly and I love the peer-to-peer -peer support because, you know, some, some things I don't experience that other people do and they help. 
We've even had Janice um, maybe go on that page at four o'clock in the morning, uh, West Coast time, and know somebody maybe was there to help yeah. her out. So tell me a little bit about how you feel that that has evolved and what, what kind of numbers now are we looking at? Well, uh, Facebook did some, it's on Facebook, our group, and it's a support group. And we are over 1,500 and we have grown slowly and we are very blessed to have some of the most awesome, awesome members. I call them our awesome members because they are, they go in there, somebody will have a question and and somebody will, in five minutes, they'll be on there and they'll be saying, oh, that happened to me and I did this. And then somebody say, oh, no, you know, try this. Because in, and, and I always tell them, you know, hey, your face, it's like a snowflake. Every, every face is different. So what's going to work for one person's bridge of their nose or what have you is not going to work for the next person. But just getting all that feedback and all that peer-to-peer advice it's gold and right. everybody is so super nice yeah. on there that i mean we never have any problems with people being ugly with each other they're they're supportive and we're just very lucky very very lucky yeah so. and i think like we we spoke about this before because there's other groups that i'm involved in with other interests and stuff and and you know there's always rules to groups and you know you can't do this or you can't say that but uh, you know, and I, I do find that people are very, very respectful and very, mm-hmm. very supportive, which is just awesome. You know, it's it's building a, a community. And again, mm-hmm. we're going into another decade, another era of um, things have changed. You know, we, we are all on social media and, um, you know, before we might have had to sit and talk to a neighbor or a friend who maybe was going through this, but now you, you can talk to somebody even in another country who's doing this, you know? Mm-hmm. So and you're also, right. I'd like to just also mention, I mean, I know that here we are on Facebook Live, um, and so everyone here is on Facebook, uh, but we also have an online forum that is accessible on our website. So, you know, if If you're part of our community and our group and you have friends or family and they're just like, well, I don't do Facebook, I'm not going there, that there are other options. Um, We have our online forum, like I said, you can access uh, from directly from our uh, sleepapnea.org website. So um, that, you know, you don't, everything isn't always Facebook, you know, dependent for Mm -hmm. for that Mm -hmm. and that feeling. There's, there's other groups out there. So, you know, I would, have uh, asked that you know you encourage your family or friend to 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 find a group that they like you know that's the whole point like you're saying kevin is the peer-to-peer support getting well you know we're we're so lucky we even have leaders from other groups that are part of our group and they share their knowledge they there's no competition you know there's no ugliness and i just i love them i just i love being there there it is that community feeling so, yeah. yeah, you know, I, and, and one of the things that also is very dear to my heart is that, you know, and Justin, maybe you can talk about this as well as the CPAP um, assistance program. And um, I feel because I do see some people on our awake Facebook page that just can't afford the supplies, can't afford a machine, and they really are crying out for therapy. Can you let people just know a little bit how that works? Sure. Uh, You can find that information about the CPAP assistance program on our website that I mentioned earlier, sleepapnea.org. But we have a program for a particular program fee. You could receive either um, a um, a CPAP machine uh, and uh, the accessories uh, or just the accessories, the masks that you need. Uh, One of the things we wanted to, to bring up today with the start of the new year is you know, replacing your supplies. We can get to that in a minute. But um, the CPAP assistance program receives machines from either manufacturers that maybe have been discontinued. So they're, they're not the newest machine, but, you know, they're not, they're just one or one or so versions down from what's, you know, currently out there on the market. Uh, or gently used machines that we receive uh, from uh, a variety of sources uh, that we go ahead and, and repurpose. And so, you know, depending on your insurance, um, you know, you're, you know, 
you could have an out-of-pocket expense from several hundred to a thousand dollars and you know we're able to help people uh, with with that program for that minimal program fee and we've also received um, some mask donations from manufacturers now all of our masks are you know factory sealed and and uh, not um, you know, not gently used in any capacity. And it's just a program that we have to help service our community uh, and, um, you know, help people in need. So you can access that on our website and you can see uh, if you need a machine or if you need a mask and some supplies. And I'll let Teresa talk a little bit about with the new year coming up, um, how that works with making sure you're up to date on changing out your accessories and supplies and cleaning and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's just so important that, you know, some people do not realize that they can replace, uh, that uh, they can replace their accessories. And what happens is, since insurance companies and all the payers have different schedules and different rules and regulations, the government and everybody decides that they're going to go on what Medicare says because that's the one constant that we have with something called uh, the Hicks Picks codes. And I won't get into that because it's kind of, you know, not not very interesting. But you do have that option of changing your equipment. For instance, if you had a, a you know, a lot of the masks will have like an interface, they'll have the mask and then they'll have like a cushion or something like that. They, uh, they can be changed sometimes two times a month. Uh, nasal pillows, two times a month. And you have to think about the pillow that actually goes into the nose, into the nasal cavities. Those have to be changed more often because it's not just natural facial oils that are breaking it down. It's the actual nasal secretions that are going to break it down. So, you know, that's very, very important. And you want to make sure that they fit, uh, that you have, uh, you know, they have them in small, medium, and large. You just have to, and sometimes it's a game of, I have to just try this one, and I have to try this one, and then I have to try this one. But, you know, it, it's your life. So it's worth it. There's a full face mask that you can get one every three months. Uh, if you have an oral nasal mask, that's the same the same thing. The nasal interface, like uh, that would go just in the nose, that's one every three months. Uh, headgear is six months. Tubing is, uh, is three to six months. So, I mean, and, you know, this can change when Medicare decides to change it. But, you know, be aware of it and check with your region to see, you know, what are the replacement schedules. Mm -hmm. And actually check with your payer because they may have a different rule, but they do need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. They break down and they are no longer sealing sometimes. So very important to know that that exists. And I can't say I, I can't say anything for the VA because everybody has a different, you know, every VA is different from the next as far as the replacement schedules. But you know, always go and check with those people that are in charge of that because it's important that you know when you are um, able to get a new one. Yeah. So, yeah. Teresa, while I have you as well, a couple of the things that we did last year, which was very exciting as well, and we did this actually in 2018, where we, you know, we worked on the awake curriculum, sorry, and um, so that we would try and enforce people or encourage people to have support groups in their communities where maybe people were feeling a little bit isolated, and someone could host a group and discuss um, you know, the issues and, and terminology regarding PAP use and, and uh, comfort and, and share experiences. But I'm looking now towards, you know, what we're doing at 2020. And just to share with the group that Teresa did share a couple of slides with me again, going back to some of the, you know, core morbidities that are associated with this. And um, so, you know, that gives us a springboard to discuss about what's happening for the coming year. 
and I see us rolling out more of those, which are great. So do you want to discuss some of the content? Oh, absolutely. We have uh, some cardiac, um, high blood pressure uh, modules coming. We have some mental health and depression and sleep apnea. And we also have a diabetes module. I mean, I think the interesting thing is sometimes you feel what came first is the, ch- the chicken or the egg, oh, right? absolutely. Did my hypertension cause me to have disruptive sleep or did my disruptive sleep cause my hypertension? And I think we're seeing that it is the disruptive sleep in a lot of these diseases, you know? Diabetes can be, you know, either like we talked earlier on, uh, familial or genetic, but um, some of the other comorbidities, like when we look at arrhythmias, I think that's where you were probably going, um, can vary very much and, and, you know, is out there to be attributed to OSA, Mm -hmm. which then leads me to you, Justine, because we discussed this as well. And I think moving towards 2020, we're hoping to have, you know, an exciting uh, year ahead with a lot of information, but also like I feel a focus on pediatric um, OSA. So I know you've firsthand experience on that and that's something I'd like you to discuss. Yes, I, um, you know, the, the, what you and Teresa were just talking about was something that, you know, we brought up at the, at the um, summit in the Presidio with the multidisciplinary care. You have all of these different physicians that are seeing sleep apnea patients and because all of these other comorbid, uh, your cardiologist and, you know, everything that, that are seeing these, these patients and they, and they go hand in hand. So that is something that we're definitely going to be focusing, continuing on in, in 2020. And then that leads a little bit more into um, looking at uh, you know, kind of prevention of this, which led us a little bit into pediatrics, because um, there is a lot that goes on with sleep apnea that is familial, meaning, you know, uh, because of the structure of your your face, your nose, your, you know, your mouth, your palate, um, your septum, all these things that are going on. And that often, you know, runs in families. So if you think about it and you just pay attention for a minute, if, you know, your uncle had sleep apnea and your dad had sleep apnea and now you got diagnosed with sleep apnea, well, it's probably about a 75% chance that one of your other siblings, if have them has may have apnea or your children um you know it it continues on those lines um some things you know present uh with with children in regards to to their sleep that you know we'll be talking about more in 2020 and you know some things may not be as apparent but then start to get complicated as they reach puberty and in their 20s and then their 30s and you know and then they just you know kind of end up on this on this chronic healthcare path, um, you know, trying to figure out what the underlying issue is. You know, moving forward in 2020, you know, we're, we're going to focus on that multidisciplinary care. We're going to focus on, you know, getting information out for people to understand the, the links between pediatrics. Um, if you remember uh, last year, we had the, um, during the summer, we had the passing of uh, Dr. Christian Gimeno, who was a um, a uh, sleep pioneer. We've put out some information, um, you know, on his career and his research and his life. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, this this later part of of his life and career was, you know, focused on on pediatrics and treating it because there are definitely things that can be done for children that will limit um, or uh, that's not the right word that will minimize uh, their uh, their condition of having apnea as they as they get older. At least you know they could offer several decades. Uh, you know, they might get it in the 60s, 70s, but that's way better than in your 30s. Sure, oh, sure. Wow. And, you know, I think that's what the, another shift, and it's been there for a while in the medical community. So it is all about preventative medicine. So, you know, we don't want people to have conditions or diseases or, you know, syndromes. We want to try and prevent these. So, looking at the pediatric population and and looking at what you said of something you feel is familial 
then it's it's reaching out to our community to say, well, maybe if I have that and my siblings have that, and do you not think maybe my kids are at risk of this too? So it's being mindful of that. So that'll be very exciting for us to present some um, information and, and data maybe on, on stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, well, I would, for, uh, oh, sorry, I, I was just going to say, I would encourage everybody to, you know, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter online, you know, we send it out quarterly. It's not, you know, we don't kind of bombard everybody. Um, you know, we have a, a monthly blog uh, on our website, and we also post that on social media to get some of that information out there. In addition to these, you know, events that we do, um, next year we're, we're interested in hosting, um, uh, uh, continuing with our patient summits and our um, patient gatherings. So we're looking in uh, 2020 to have our third patient summit in um, May, May of 2020 in Miami. Miami, Florida. So, you know, we hope that you will join us, um, you know, on on any and all of these uh, initiatives that we're going to be putting out for for this year. Great, great. That's something really to look forward. Well, as a, as a wrap up now, anything else that we should look forward to 2020 about, um, you know, what we should expect or any new initiatives that are out there? Um, uh, um, just right now, you know, can Continuing on, on, on that multidisciplinary approach, you know, focusing on, on pediatrics. We're super excited to have the summit coming up in, in May and just kind of growing, you know, growing our community. Teresa, you have uh, anything? Oh, absolutely. I, I think it's such a, a good time, you know, for us to be using this, you know, this agenda because, you know, following on Healthy People 2020, the the federal government's actual prevention agenda to to build a healthier nation, and we need to do that with sleep. And and it, it it's sort of a statement of national health objectives, you know, designed to identify the most preventable threats to health and to, you know, establish national goals to reduce those threat and the work that we're doing at the summits in Miami will be you know very much on view for uh for these initiatives because I'll tell you uh, again you know coming from the patient you know the patient perspective uh this is how we learn how to improve things yeah you know, and I always say sometimes we have to, you know, maybe encourage people to be advocates for themselves because when people don't have that forward thinking attitude about sleep and taking sleep for granted, and I mean people in the medical community or your provider that you see, when you do go to the doctor's office and say you're fatigued or you're, you know, as we've seen before, sm- falling asleep at the wheel, mm-hmm. um, you know, as I'd said to the, you know, earlier on during the summit in, in San Francisco, Dr. Sullivan done a great job. And obviously she's a great advocate and great has great understanding about how this can impact people's lives. So, you know, moving forward, that's what we want to try and, and, and pose upon people and impress upon people to be, be your own advocate. And that's what we're here for as well, to get the therapy um that you need and and be listened and heard yeah and i i I remember um dr casey lee saying one thing at the summit he was on that multidisciplinary panel talking with one of the patients and you know he was like i think you need to find another doctor (laughs) Um, you know if you're not feeling better and it's not going well you know, you need you need to get a second opinion. You need to you know mm-hmm. go talk to somebody else. And there's no there's no there's no shame in that. I mean, you know, oh, everyone no. should have a restful night's sleep, be able to you know make it through the day happy and healthy. Um, and you know, if you're struggling with some of those things, um, you know, yeah, you, you need to be the advocate for yourself to get those answers. Yeah. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, listen, thank you so much. I really appreciate you both being on board and sharing your knowledge and expertise. And 
putting it out there to our communities. And, and again, I encourage our communities, people out there to, you know, reach out and help people if you feel that, you know, something resonates with you and you've gone through an experience that you see on maybe our Awake page or some other forum, you know, reach out and, and, and share your experience to say, here's how I overcome that. Because it's, it's really, really is beneficial. And, and, you know, when we read these two, we, we learn as well and we appreciate them. So until our next time, um, let us know when we go live with this or we push it to our forums, we'll be in the wings to answer questions. So please feel free to ask Teresa, Justine or myself anything that you need or even other people out there. And we'll be happy to try and respond accordingly. Okay, so that's it for tonight. Thank you again, Justine and Teresa. And we hope you all have a really restful night's sleep. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night.